Uh, but CPEG is interesting. It's interesting in terms of kind of the positioning of the Republican Party. The, the battle lines are clearly drawn now. Who is and isn't invited to CPAC uh, is, is kind of where the battle lines are. It's, it's, it's interesting because the battle lines are not conservative, not conservative. The battle lines are more around pro-Trump, anti-Trump, or pro-Trump, not so pro-Trump, pro-Trump, not completely pro-Trump. You know, it's, it's the, the, the line is basically how religious are you about Trump? That is, the, that is what CPAC is drawing the line. It used to be about whether you were conservative or not. Certainly many Republicans were never invited to CPAC because they just weren't conservative. It was typically a place where the most conservative of uh, the senators, of House members, of intellectuals, of radio talk show hosts were invited. But this year, and, and uh, this year it's clear, this year it's clear that this, the, the criteria by which the speakers uh, were determined was their loyalty to Donald Trump. So conservatives, real conservatives, actual conservatives who hold conservatives' points of view, who vote conservative, like Ben Sass or like Nikki Haley or like John Bolton, were not invited. Uh, all of them uh, spoke spoken at CPAC many, many, many times, but this year clearly not invited, despite the fact that many in the Republican Party consider Nikki Haley one of the front runners for the uh, for the for the primaries, at least uh, for for president in 2024. Uh, some even consider Ben Sass to be such. Uh, ben Sass has been a very popular senator. Except, um, except for the last couple of years with uh, with Trump, uh, but it's very it's very interesting how the line has been drawn. He, he, who has been invited? Well, Ted Cruz and uh, and Senator Josh Hawley, uh, Josh Hawley, who I've been talking about for 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 a, at least a year, maybe two. Uh, we'll get to Jen, uh, Hawley in a minute. Uh, he, of course. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of the intellectuals who have supported Trump nonstop, a lot of the House members have supported uh, Donald Trump nonstop, including pretty pretty far right in the collectivist sense uh, members. One of those uh, House members spoke earlier uh, in the day at Nick Fuentes' uh, gathering, and then came over to CPAC uh, following Nick Fuentes' racist. Uh, gathering also in Florida, in 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 Orlando. So, uh, yes, the battle lines are drawn across the kind of collectivist, populist uh, line. No more is it about uh, uh, conservatism uh, or, or what used to be considered conservative ideas. Uh, which brings me to, you know, Josh Hawley. You remember Josh Hawley? Uh, I've talked about him a lot. National conservative, uh, senator, one of the senators who, who questioned the, the who uh, wanted an investigation into the election fraud. One of the senators who were trying to hold up certification of the vote uh, during uh, the Senate, and and uh, one of the, the senator who famously raised the fist to the uh, demonstrators outside Capitol Hill on January six. But more importantly. I think one of the smartest senators in terms of just credentials, Ivy League education, uh, considered very, very smart, and a leader of the national conservative kind of movement. And I just want to show you a 30-second clip of his, uh, of his talk at CPAC. Uh, I think it was earlier today. Just to give you a sense of what the... Republican Party of tomorrow, the Republican Party of today, the Republican Party of Donald Trump, is all about, is all about. So uh, we're going to play this 30-second segment. I'll try to run the whole 30 seconds without interrupting Senator Josh Hawley. Let it just play out uh, and, and see what you think. This to me, this guy to me, you know, we'll see if there's a real negative outcome out of January 6th. But this guy, to me, is the most dangerous political force in America today. He's young. He's charismatic. He's energetic. As I said, he's smart. He's well-educated. He knows what he's doing. And his ideas 
about as evil as I gets on 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 the right. So uh, he goes, Josh Hawley, um, at CPAC. Oh, let me put my headphones so I can listen to this too. By these modern day oligarchs. What we need is a new nationalism, a new agenda to make the rule of the people real in this country and give the people America back. Give it back to them. Give it back to you. No more ruled by oligarchs, ruled by the people. That's what we've got to do. And I can tell you how I would start. I would start by breaking up the big tech corporations. Just break them up. Break them up in the name of the rule of the people by these modern day oligarchs what we need is a new nationalism a new once is enough <laughs> so um, Josh Hawley calling for a new nationalism whoops let me let me move on from you don't have to see his picture there's no reason for that. I don't need the headphones. Uh, Josh Hawley calling for a new nationalism, a nationalism where the state, in the name of the people, breaks up businesses. That could have been a line straight out of... Straight out of whom? Straight out of any Democrat. Straight out of... AOC, straight out of anybody on the radical left, on the far left, and rule of the people. Well, isn't that what we got? Isn't that what we call voting? Wasn't Joe Biden elected by the people? Don't we have now a president elected by the people? Isn't that how the American system worked? Don't we have a Congress of the people? And break them up in the name of the people. Notice, not in the name of individual rights, the founding fathers, the Constitution, the Declaration. Oh, no. None of that is relevant to the modern Republican Party. None of that is relevant to Donald Trump's political party. None of that is relevant to Josh Hawley. I think one of the premier leaders of at least this wing of the Republican Party moving into the future. Now, it's about breaking them up because that's what the people, not all the people, the people that matter once. This is what populism is exactly, the rule of the people. I mean, maybe we should introduce Ross Perot's um, idea of uh, you get a little button that you can link up uh, to the internet. In those days, you would link it up to the TV, to the cable, um, and you get to vote on everything. To hell with the House of Representatives and the Senate. Let's have direct democracy. Let's have rule by the people. which is what Ross Perot wanted with the little button by the television. Uh, Cook says, Teddy Roosevelt also campaigned on a new nationalism and popularized antitrust. Absolutely. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt uh, used to make my top five worst presidents of all time, probably still does. I haven't reconsidered my worst five presidents of all time because I, I don't know how to squeeze Obama and Trump into that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and still get uh, all the really bad guys in there. But Teddy Roosevelt definitely makes it because Teddy Roosevelt is the beginning of the end. He is the first progressive president of the United States. He is the one who introduces nationalism. He is the one that introduces conservationism, environmentalism, if you will. He is the one who really becomes a strong advocate of antitrust. And he is one who advocated for war. He was one, uh, a big one, in terms of uh, military adventures. Military adventures. 
Oh, you guys want the top five, the bottom five? It's hard to figure out exactly, right? Because again, there's so many of them now. There's so many bad ones. But certainly Teddy would be in there. Wilson would have to be in there. And FDR would have to be there, though FDR was a good wartime president. That is, he was a terrible peacetime president and a, and a decent wartime president. Uh, but, but certainly for, for his, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's hard not to include Hoover because Hoover's really the one who led us into the Great Depression. And in that sense, is a horrific ter- president. So, so Hoover has to be, would have to be there. Uh, Stephanie says um, Nixon and Johnson. Yeah, I mean, Johnson gave us the welfare state and gave us Medicare and Medicaid. Hard to beat that. And of course, Nixon gave us every environmental regulation we have in the books, including all the regulatory agencies like the EPA, responsible for enforcing the environmental regulations. And then you've got Obama with Obamacare. You've got Bush with the ridiculous wars in the Middle East and then with the financial crisis trying to save capitalism by violating its principles. Um, And you've got Trump, who who just brings down the, 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 the essence of the presidency. So I don't know what you do with that, right? So that is what, Trump, uh, Obama, Bush, Nixon, Johnson, that's five just in the last 50 years, and then you've got, or 60 years, and then you've got um, Roosevelt, Wilson, and, um, and, um, and Teddy, that's eight. Those are my eight worst presidents. And notice the three of them are the last three presidents. We'll see how, how Obama, I, I'm sorry, how... Um, Biden does, right? How Biden does. All right, so let's see. So CPEC is going to be interesting. So CPEC is drawing the line uh, between the, if you will, the new nationalists, the kind of a America first uh, in the Trump sense of the word, uh, conservatives who want to manage the economy, who want to manage trade, who are vehemently anti-immigration, uh, Republicans who are dedicated to Trump as an individual. Notice that Trump will be giving the final speech at CPAC. There was also a big sculpture. Did you see the big statue at CPAC? A big statue of Donald Trump in gold, uh, wearing uh, a, a box of shorts with uh, with American flag on them. Um, you know this 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 uh, talk about uh, talk about the worship of the man. Uh, versus everybody else. You can see the statue. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can see the videos of the statue being wheeled through, wheeled through the convention center at CPAC and everybody wanting a picture of, of, uh, of the golden Trump. Uh, so, you know, this part of the Republican Party is firmly, firmly in Trump's grasp. This is uh, this is he dominates as part of the Republican Party. Now, note that they forget and they don't mention the fact that during Trump's presidency, put aside the fact that he lost the White House, of course they're questioning that election, but that the Republicans lost the House of Representatives in 2018. I don't think they questioned that election. They lost the Senate and they lost the White House. And yet, notice his grasp on the party it doesn't matter that he's a loser that's brought about massive losses to the Republican Party. That doesn't matter. He's got this grip on them, which is an emotional grip. And I think the source of that grip is fundamentally his message. It's his... Hatred of the left, and, and hatred of the left, at least in speech, you know, he's quite friendly with them, I think, in person. But hatred of the left in speech is, is, is his, uh, uh, you know, willingness to fight them verbally in whatever ugly manner it chooses. It's, it's anti-trade, anti-immigration, big government spending, populism that makes him attractive to this crowd. And it's his non-ideological, it's his pragmatism. It's his anti 
intellectualism, his anti-ideology views that make him attractive to this audience. Now, Josh Hawley is an ideologue, is an ideologue. And at the end, ideology always wins. In the end, ideals, ideas and ideals always win. And what Trump is setting the stage for is for the takeover of the Republican Party by the Josh Hawleys of the world. Notice like a, a foreign policy hawk, a real American first foreign policy hawk like John Bolton is not there. A real fiscal conservative who truly believes in reducing government spending like Ben Sass is not there. A, a, a conservative who still attempts to defend capitalism, she doesn't do it very well, but still attempts to defend capitalism, Nikki Haley is not there. Because it's no longer about capitalism, about free markets, or about a proper American foreign policy in America, true America first foreign policy. It's about Trump, and it's nothing else. What's interesting is going to be, can this other side of the Republican Party the, the Republican Party that has not represented at CPAC, can they mount a challenge to Trump? Do they have enough backing? Do they have enough support? Can they evoke enough enthusiasm out there to present an alternative to what is going on right now at CPAC? And that is, that is hard to tell, but that is the war that we're going to be living through for the next I'd say four years, but it's probably next decade or two, within the Republican Party. And it is going to be a war. And who wins it will, to a large extent, determine, I think, the ultimate fate of this country. The fate of this country will now be determined by the Democrats unless the Republicans are completely impotent and leave all of the politics to the left. Because the, the country's not on the left. So it's going to be interesting. It's interesting to watch, sickening to watch, uh, disgusting to watch, but important. Important because it shapes the future. We need, America needs an opposition party to the left. America needs a party that at least nominally stands for individual rights and free markets. Nominally, not in the sense that we mean it. A, a party that still longs for the founding fathers. That is, that is the battle. Nicholas says the GOP is lost. Nobody will stamp up, up against Trump. We'll see. If that is true, then the GOP indeed is lost. And they might lose many, many, many serial elections into the future unless Biden completely implodes. And Biden... I think he's going to get lucky, and he might, and he's not going to implode. But you know, we're going to see. We're going to see exactly what happens. All right, a great job on the super chat so far, guys. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder... Please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. It, all it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes 
But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at yourunbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>